Hi, and welcome to Easter at Cross Point Church. My name is Matt, and I'm the Ventura Campus Pastor. Hey, and I'm Brian. I'm the senior pastor here at Cross Point Church, and we want to welcome you to this special Easter service in the middle of this coronavirus pandemic. You know, this is an Easter unlike any Easter that any of us have ever experienced in our lifetime. Did you know that this is the first Easter uh, in the last 2,000 years of Christianity where we haven't been able to gather together in large groups? Now, I recognize that our, our country is going through a storm right now. Some of you are going through a storm. We're all going through a storm, but we're not all in the same boat. For some of you, it's sprinkling. And this is a season where you get to rest. This is a season where you get to pause and reflect and spend some extra time with your family. And it's kind of a bummer because it's sprinkling outside. You can't go outside. But for some of you, this is a storm. For some of you, this is scary. This is a, a keeping you up at night and waking you up at night. It's a disruption and, and you're watching the news, wondering how long this storm is going to last. And for some of you, it's not a sprinkle. It's not a storm. This is a full-blown hurricane. And it's tearing apart the beams in your house. It's ripping off the roof of your home. This is a time when you feel a lot of uncertainty. It's dark. You don't know how long this is going to continue to go on. And you feel scared about yourself and your future, as well as your family as well. See, I'm reminded of the very first Easter, whenever the disciples on that Friday witnessed the the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And they felt a moment of death. It was a death blow. It was a moment of of darkness. It was a storm. And on Saturday, it was disbelief. It was wonder what was happening. But I want to tell you, Friday didn't last and Saturday didn't last because Friday and Saturday turned into Sunday. And Sunday was the day of resurrection. And that's what we celebrate today. We celebrate the fact that we're not going to stay in Friday. We're not going to stay in Saturday. That Sunday is coming. It was the day that Jesus rose from the dead. It was a day of celebration. And I want to tell you that Easter, it's not a location It is a celebration. And you and I, we may be apart, but you are not alone. Did you know that today, 3.2 billion people are going to celebrate Easter today? Most of them in online services, just like us. So many people are celebrating Easter today. You are not alone. And I also want to tell you that even though we may be separated You're not isolated. Listen, Jesus says, I am with you. I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Jesus rose from the dead and we celebrate today. And some of you are like me. I'm so excited. I kind of feel like Tom Cruise when he was on the Oprah Winfrey show, when he got on that couch and he just started jumping. Listen, you're at your home today. If you want to get on your couch and celebrate Jesus is alive, you can get on your couch right now. Listen, some, some of you kids are looking at your parents and looking at your mom or looking at your dad, asking for permission. Maybe you just need to give each other a high five. So if you're watching this with somebody else, just give them a high five and say, Jesus is alive. But some of you today, maybe you feel like there's disciples. And this is a season where you feel loaded with discouragement, defeat. Maybe you're alone watching this today and you're just loaded with doubt. And we want, to talk, we want to talk for a second to those of you who do feel just ridden with doubt right now that this is, a, this is an okay place to be filled with it. That it's okay to be filled with, with doubt and to question whether any of this is actually true. In fact, here at Crosspoint, we believe this. Uh, you can belong before you ever actually believe, which means that if you don't believe this, you're at the right place at the right time. In fact, here's something that noted author and pastor Ben Young actually said about this very topic. He says... Regardless of how you came to doubt, doubt itself is not the problem. But what can be problematic and even tragic is what you do with your doubt. You know, it's funny is I'm sure a lot of you really thought that this was the year that you weren't going to be with grandma. And so somehow (laughs) you weren't going to get dragged to church. But here you are from the comfort of your own living room, still watching an Easter service. And if that's you, I want to give you some credit for a second. 
Because I, I don't think that your mind and your thought process is, is totally off. I think that, that if you really do, do a deep dive into what we actually say we believe, there's some craziness to it. I mean, let's, let's take for a second, even those of you who are Christians, that like you've been in church forever, I want you to take a moment, I want you to divorce yourself from your upbringing, I want you to divorce yourself from the countless hours you've spent in chairs listening to people like us just tell you, hey, here's something that was written a couple thousand years ago, and uh, here's why you can believe it. Uh, I want you to hear this as if it's the very first time. We believe that there is a man who claimed to be God, that he really grew up in obscurity, working class family, and then as he becomes an adult, he, he is homeless. And he starts to give these public presentations and he starts to gather a crowd. And over time, uh, it starts to upset the ruling power so much that they say, this guy needs to be killed. And so they execute him. But even before they execute him, they beat him to with an inch of his life. Then they crucify him, which means that they drive these stakes through his hands and his feet. And then they put him on public display and he actually doesn't even die from the pain. He dies from suffocation that holding his body up for countless hours is too much, especially after the beating, and he dies from asphyxiation. And then we believe this. He was put into a grave, and after three days, the stone is rolled away, his body is gone, and he's come back from the dead. I mean, if, if that's the first time you've ever heard that story, that's wild. And that's why today we're starting a brand new series called The Problem of God. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the problem of the resurrection. That for a lot of people, it's a real hang up and something they can't get over. And we wanna give you reasons why you can logically believe that this is true without having to check your brain out. Next week, we're gonna talk about the problem of pain, suffering, and evil. Or maybe in other words, why would God allow us to walk through a season like this, like the coronavirus? And then the third week, we're gonna talk about the problem of the Bible. Some of you went to college and you had a professor tell you there's so many inconsistencies, there's so many contradictions, that you can't possibly accept something that was written 2,000 to 3,500 years ago as if it was fact. And then on the last week, we're going to talk about the problem of hypocrisy. Some of you, you've seen people say one thing and do something completely different, and you can't get over that. Well, this is the type of series where we want to go right at those problems and say, let's talk about this, and let's talk about why you can still be credible and actually believe these things. Um, some of you, you wrestle with the reliability of the scripture. Some of you wrestle with the reliability of miracles. Some of you look at the dark history of the church and say, there's no possible way I can reconcile this. Some of you, you you've been treated like trash by people who wear the t-shirt that says Jesus follower. And that bothers you. Well, this series is going to be for you. In fact, the actual definition for problem is this. It's a question raised for inquiry, consideration, or solution. It's an intricate, unsettled question. And that's what this, is, what this whole thing is all about. In fact, this whole story actually kind of, or this whole thing reminds me of a story uh, from Jesus's life, where one day he's walking into this village when there's this large crowd assembled, and there's a little bit of a scuffle going on. And so as Jesus gets closer, one of the people excuses himself, and they go to Jesus, and they say, here's the problem, that there's a man in our village who has a son who's really sick. In fact, we believe that he's been tormented by a demon. And your disciples said that they could cast that demon out. And they tried and they failed. So Jesus looks at him and says, hey, bring this boy to me. And at that, the boy's dad actually hears, overhears this and goes to Jesus and says, um, yeah, I, I will bring him to you if you can do something about it. And Jesus says, if everything is possible for one who believes, and the boy's father looks at Jesus and says this. Okay, okay. I believe, but help my unbelief. And the thing is, so many of us, we live right there. We want to believe. We want to have faith. We want to believe this is all true. But God, help my unbelief. See, here's the secret a lot of us have found out. That the longer you walk with Jesus, the more you realize that doubt and faith can still coexist. So today we're going to talk about the problem of the resurrection. And here's what I'll share with you. If the resurrection isn't true, then we're just wasting our time right now. You might as well log off and log into Netflix and just binge watch some shows and some movies all day today. Because Christianity hinges on the belief that Jesus rose from the dead. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 14. He says, and if Christ 
has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then this means absolutely nothing at all. But we don't believe that. We believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And so what we want to do is we want to share with you four reasons today why we believe Jesus rose from the dead. And so I'm going to jump right into it. The first one is this. The question is, if this was all a farce, if, the, if this was a myth, if this is a legend, if they, they believe that Jesus did die, then the question is, where is the dead body? Listen, in the ancient world, there in Jerusalem, they hated Jesus so much that they crucified him publicly. They put him on a cross. They shamed him in front of the whole city, the whole town, because they didn't want him to overthrow their empire. They were afraid of his power. They were afraid of his authority. And so they hated him so much, they crucified him. Well, then after he rose from the dead, all the disciples were saying, he's, he's alive. And we're going to share more with you in just a little bit. And if they wanted to take Jesus out, that they wanted to stop this whole line of thinking, and they wanted to just cut Christianity off at the knees, all they had to do was produce the dead body, but they couldn't. You know why? Because there was no body there in the grave. He rose from the dead. Now, the second reason why we believe that you can still believe that Jesus, is, that Jesus resurrected is because if this whole thing was made up, like if they just went into a back room and said, let's write this story and let's try and make it credible for, for everybody else, why would they have women discover the empty tomb? Why did women discover the empty tomb? Uh, in fact, let me, just, let me just acknowledge something that a lot of us, our 21st century sensibilities are on overdrive right now. Like, why would this even be a question? Why would this even be a point? Well, I want you to transport yourself back 2,000 years ago to how that society and that world viewed women. In fact, this is something that Jewish historian Josephus actually said about women's testimony in a legal proceeding in court. It says, let not the testimony of women be admitted on account of the levity and the boldness of their sex. I mean, this is wild for us to think about. But 2,000 years ago, in the ancient world, this is how women were viewed. The first is that women were not regarded as credible witnesses. And so if you were going to write a story and say like, hey, here's why we can believe it's true, you wouldn't have women be the one to discover it. Like you would, you would try and have somebody that was of upstanding reputation in the city. You would try and find somebody that, that everyone would say, well, I can believe that. That is true. In fact, in that day and age, to hear the testimony of a woman would be a lot like, hey, where'd you get that information? Well, I got it from the National Enquirer. And like it would be received kind of the same way. And the second, the second is this. Women were largely regarded as second-class citizens in that day and age. This is, this is what rabbinic tradition, and just to be clear, this is not what the Bible says this is, what, this is what abuse of power and what a patriarchal, a patriarchal society will develop over time to say. It says, sooner let the words of the law be burnt than delivered to women. Happy is he whose children are male, but unhappy is he whose children are female. And so the reason I bring all this up is because why is it recorded that women discovered the empty tomb? It's because it's true. If they wanted to fabricate it, they wouldn't have written it, that, written it that way. And furthermore, this wasn't written to try and convince Simon, the, you know, the high tanner that lives in a village nearby that this is true. It's in the Bible because it's accurate. And it's also intentional. See, we believe that regardless of what society has to say, that Jesus wants to elevate the position, the dignity, and the value and the worth of women to see them as equals within our own world. See, we believe that Jesus was very intentional, that he wanted to go down in the annals of history, that when everybody else abandoned Jesus after his crucifixion, the women stayed. And because of that, I believe that we can believe that Jesus actually came back from the dead. Well, I believe Jesus did more for women to add value and dignity to worth than probably any other person in the history of mankind. And there's a third reason why we believe that Jesus rose from the dead, because Jesus appeared to over 500 people after the resurrection. Jewish historian Josephus also said in history that he witnessed Jesus, that many people witnessed the sighting of Jesus. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3. He said, I passed on to you 
what was most important and what has been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He, he went on, he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 5, uh, it says that he was seen by Peter and then by the 12. And then verse 5, it says, after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time most of whom, Paul says, are still alive. Some have died. So he said, some of those people are still alive today. He says, go talk to them. They were, they were able to witness the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus appeared. He didn't just appear to a small group of disciples, to a handful of people that were his closest followers. He appeared to over 500 people publicly. And I think that this is significant because I, you got to think that Jesus, he actually spread all throughout, you know, we're talking about him today, but, but Christianity, it started in the very place where he died on the cross. That's where this thing sprung up from, and that's where it took off from. And so understand that 500 people witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, if we were to go to a, a witness testimony, and if you were to take all 500 of these witnesses and, and put them on trial, and you were to give them six minutes each, including the cross examination, that would be over 50 hours of testimony. Listen, that would be the most lopsided trial in the history of mankind that they would be testifying that Jesus rose from the dead because they saw him with their own eyes. And actually, I want to chase that thought for a second because I believe though another one of the great like evidences that this can actually be trusted and true is that not only did people witness it, but most of the disciples were actually martyred for their belief in the resurrection. And Think about this for a second. What would be your motivation in making up a whole new religion? Is it, is it fame? Is it power? Is it wealth? I mean, really the story of Christianity and how it spread after Jesus' death and resurrection is that the people who claimed to witness it, the people who started the first churches, they didn't receive any of those things. There was no fame. There was no wealth. There was no power. In fact, almost all of his disciples were killed for this. In fact, the only one who wasn't martyred for like claiming that this was true, uh, he was actually was boiled alive and somehow lived because he went to the grave saying, I can trust this 100%. I mean, that is incredible. My question is how long until you would give up the sham? How long until you would just say, uncle, like I'm done with this. Like I, I'm just gonna go ahead and admit that this was all a lie, unless it's true. Then you're willing to go to the grave for it. Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 6, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Now, a lot of people try to dismiss Jesus as just being a good person. Jesus was a good teacher. But the truth is this. I love what C.S. Lewis says. C.S. Lewis says, Jesus is either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. If there was any other way to get to heaven except through him, then he lied to us. Or else, if he was a good teacher, I can be a good teacher. And you can say, Brian, you're, you're a really good teacher. But the moment I say I'm the only way to get to heaven, that makes me a lunatic. He's not a liar. He's not a lunatic. We believe he is Lord. And because we believe in the, in the resurrection, this is good news. This is great news for you today. Because here's what this means today. In the middle of this pandemic, in 2020, why does the resurrection matter? There's three reasons why it matters. Number one, if the resurrection is true, Easter matters because your past can be forgiven. Have you ever got halfway through a test and wish you could start over? Have you ever got halfway through a project and, and you wish you could start over again? See, some of you may feel that way about life. You got halfway through life and you wish you could start over. And you can't get past your past. And the reason why some of you are not happy right now is because you're so stuck in your past. A past mistake, a past relationship, a past hurt. Maybe you feel loaded down by guilt and regret, and because of your sin, because of those what was I thinking moments, it has you defeated and discouraged at this season and this time, and you're weighed down with a lot of emotional baggage. Listen, I have some good news for you. 
Because of the resurrection of Jesus, your past can be forgiven. Here's what Colossians 1.14 says. It says, he has forgiven all our sins. And I love this word. And he canceled every record of the debt we owed. It's canceled. It's done away. Listen, after you pay a bill, how, how long do you remember it after it's already been paid? You don't remember it all because it's been canceled. Colossians says, Christ has done away with all of your past sins by nailing it to the cross. It has been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Easter matters because your past can be forgiven. But you know, Easter also matters because your present can be managed. I mean, here's the great message of Easter. If Jesus Christ is powerful enough to move the stone covering his grave, he's powerful enough to manage the smaller stones that block you in your life. I believe this, that most people, they'll come to us and they'll say, hey, you know, my life is out of control. We hear this thousands of times. And what they say is my life is out of control because of the wreckage of the coronavirus. My life is out of control because I just can't seem to break this bad habit. My life is out of control because I can't get out of this bad relationship. My life is out of control because I can't get my, hand, my handle on, on my finances. My life is out of control because I, I just never have enough time and my schedule is always filled to the brim. Like we have really good news for you today. Like what you need is a power that is greater than yourself. And we believe that power is in Jesus Christ. Romans 8.11 says this, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, he lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he's going to give you, he's going to give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. And I believe this, God might not change your circumstances, but he can change you. Because of the resurrection, your past can be forgiven and your present can be managed. And if that was it, that would be reason enough to put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. But he also gives us a third promise. Because of Easter, your future can be secure. That you can be secure in your future after this life is over. You know, we all have a universal problem and it's called death. I recently checked statistics and they tell us one out of every one of us dies. And right now, in this coronavirus season right now, and we're waking up every day and watching the news and hearing stories about more lives that have tragically died through the coronavirus. And my heart breaks. My heart breaks for our country. My, my heart breaks for our world right now. But the reality of death, the Bible says that it is appointed unto man once to die. Every one of us are going to stand before God one day. And the question is this. Will you be able to answer the question that God's going to ask you of why should I let you in? See, there's two ways to get to heaven, and I'm going to share them with you. The first way is called the performance plan. And here's how you get into heaven. You have to be perfect. That means that you can never lie. You can never cheat. You can never have a lustful thought. Listen, you, you, you can do no wrong. You have to be perfect your entire life. It would be as if they changed the rules to the Baseball Hall of Fame. And the only way that you could get in is to play error-free ball your entire career. If you had to bat a thousand every single time, we know even the best only hit the ball 30% of the time. See, you don't qualify for the performance plan. Listen, heaven's perfect, God's perfect, I'm not and you're not. So we don't qualify for plan A. So God came up with plan B. And here's plan B. Plan B was that he was going to send his son to this sin-saturated world to die on the cross for our sin, to pay the price of our sin because he so desperately wanted a relationship with you. And if you ever wondered how much God loves you, he loves you this much. He says, I'd rather die than live without you. And here's what God asked of us. He asked of us to trust in him, to ask him to forgive us of our sins and take full control of our life today. If you would like to do that today, if you would like your past forgiven, if you want your present to be managed, the Bible says the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is available to you right now in the middle of this coronavirus se season that we're in. And if you want your future secure, then here's how you do that. You pray and you put your trust and faith in Jesus. And I would encourage you to do that right now with me. 
So I want to ask you just to pray this prayer. You just say it out loud. God hears you. You're in, the, in your living room, wherever you're watching this right now, maybe in the bedroom, wherever you are, just pray this prayer and say, dear God, I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin and take full control of my life. God, I want my past to be forgiven. God, I need your power to manage my present. I don't need willpower. I need God power. And God, I'm putting my future in your hands. And I'm believing that God, you will give me security in my future. My security in my future for tomorrow and also after this life. I'm trusting in you today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.